Okay, cool. Um, hello, everyone. This is exciting. A little bit terrifying, so be kind. Um, thank you. Uh, so I want to talk to you about um, a journey that God has brought me on over the last few years, but in the last year, it's felt like he's really accelerated that and has spoken to me very clearly on it. And I just really wanted to share that. Um, but to start with, who's hungry? Hands up. Okay, so I thought we'd start with a little bit of light refreshment. Um, so I've got some, got some fake Maryland cookies, you lucky bunch. Who, who would like them? Okay, cool. We'll, we'll start over here. Okay. If you could sort of spread them around, everyone make sure you've got a cookie. Um, oh, great. You, you spread the cookies and I'll be clipped. And then this there. Is that okay? Can you hear me? Brilliant. Okay, how do you feel, guys? You enjoying your cookies? Um, but there were some other people who were hungry. Who else was hungry? You guys there. So I've got, um, I've got some really posh finest, well they are little, but they're really posh little. So go pass them around guys, you enjoy those. Now, how do you guys over here feel now? Are you still enjoying your cookies as much? Oh look at Georgia's face. She is not enjoying that cookie as much as she should be. Um, and, and the thing that I want to speak about this morning is this. Um, because I think in life, often we can look at our little cookie and we think, oh, that's great, until we look next door and we see someone's got a giant luxury cookie. And that can apply to all areas of our life, can't it? It can be our relationships, it can be our jobs, it can be our houses, it can be our position in church and how we feel you know, people perceive us. And actually, I think this is something that is built into us, this, this need to compare. It's not something that we choose to do necessarily, it's, it's a subconscious process that goes on. And I really believe that for me, definitely, comparison is the thief of joy. Um, it's a quote from probably Theodore Roosevelt, they're not quite sure, but I realised about a year ago that I just felt a bit rubbish and a bit discontent and, and was, found myself really looking for things to fill the gap. And I'd look at what other people had and I thought, oh, well, yeah, it's all right for them. And sometimes I'd even look at my cookie, if you like, and I'd, I'd think, oh, well, if I'd made a different decision back then, I'd have a bigger cookie. And I'd, I'd start comparing my life to, to other choices I could have made and other paths I could be on. And that was really stealing my joy. Um, so I'm going to start with a little bit of why we might compare ourselves, um, which, which is a little bit bleak. <laughs> But I think God, God has shown me that there's, there's stuff we can do about this. His, his plan for us is different to a life of constantly feeling like we need what the next person has or we have to be on top of our game to be winning. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever braved the next Boxing Day sale. Has anyone ever done that? See, see, Anna has. Seen how people get when they are in those shops and it feels like there's, there's only one pair of trousers in the world and you've got to get that pair of trousers. Um, but it's, it, there's something innate within us, this kind of primal um, desire to have the thing that someone else has. Maybe we didn't even know we wanted it, but when we see someone else has got it, that, that becomes our heart's desire. Um, I was in a shop last year and I saw a table on sale and I thought, great, I'm, I'm going to buy that table. So I went and stood by it and asked a, a salesperson to come and help me like, move it to the till. Um, and because it was a good deal, it was like watching, watching other shoppers notice me with this last table. It was like watching vultures circling. They were kind of like, oh, is she going to have that? I want to be next in line if she's not having that. And it was like this kind of subtle British kind of passive-aggressive kind of shopping experience. And it was a bit scary, but it, that, that's that thing at play. Like, I didn't know I wanted that table, but she's got it. I definitely want it. Um, so whether you're a sciencey person, um, you know, I, there's lots of studies into comparison and what causes us to compete. Um, and they believe that maybe there's an advantage to it. Well, we can see that there's an advantage to it because if, if you're constantly wanting to compete, then you're going to do better, aren't you? Um, and whether you kind of 
want to focus on the more biblical kind of element of it. It's been there right from the beginning. Adam and Eve were completely content in the Garden of Eden. They had absolutely everything they could ever need until the serpent caused them to notice what they lacked. This is what he said. You will be like God when you eat from it, knowing good and evil. They didn't know that they wanted to be like God until he pointed it out. They were completely content until they saw he's got something that we don't have, and that isn't fair. And that's what caused them to sin. And I think it's obvious that they ended up in a much worse position because of that comparison. Um, So while it's always been there, there's something about the society we live in today that actually, I think, accelerates that and and makes that um, kind of speeds up that subconscious process in, in us, makes it always available to us to compare ourselves with other people or other things that we might want. Um, I really like this advert. Um, And actually, (laughs) actually, we use markers that are given to us by other people to try and define our value or how successful we are. And that's a ridiculous example. But Sorry, it says, they're young, they're in love, they eat lard. Um, And obviously, look, they're living the high life. That's the dream, isn't it? <laughs> but, and if, to us, that's completely absurd. But actually, we believe messages like that the whole time that we see on TV or we see, you know, someone's got something that we don't have and we think, oh, well, that's, that's what I want. Um, so the, the whole marketing industry is built on causing us to compare ourselves to other people. That, that's why it exists, to make us want the next thing, to make us be on top of our game in whatever area. <coughs> Social media means that we've got this constant barrage of your life's not quite like that, your life's not quite like that person, look at that holiday they're on, look at how successful they are in their job, look at how many children they've got, look at their beautiful new house. You know, we're constantly compelled to compare ourselves whether we like it or not if that's what we expose ourselves to. Um, And I don't know about you, but sometimes I will come off social media and I just feel a bit rubbish and I can't quantify it but I think it's that thing underneath eroding at my sense of value, saying, well, you're not valuable because you don't have as much as they have. Um, So our education system, I think, is built on comparison. My five-year-old came out of school last year, and they were all waving their spelling tests with percentages along the top, and I was walking along next to a little boy and his mum, and he had 90% written at the top of his test, and I was about to congratulate him, and his mum says to me, oh, he failed. He failed because another boy next to them had got 100%. And it just struck me, how wrong is that? That's what we're building into our children at school. And actually, as a parent, I've got a responsibility to give a different message about where my children's value comes from. Um, Step counters. Anybody enjoy these? Yeah? You might wear it on a watch or on your phone. And sometimes I get home, I'm like, I've done 8,000 steps. Well done, me. And then it tells me, you're in the bottom 50% of people using this app. (laughs) And suddenly, it's not quite such such an achievement. And I feel like, oh, well, there's 50% of the world who have more steps than me today, so I'm not doing that well. Um, But I was perfectly content with my 8,000 steps before. And it it just goes to show, as as we bring in kind of other markers, other people as our kind of bearing of how valuable we are, it knocks us off course and it distracts us from what's really important. Um, okay, new parents. This is another example. Definitely one that I've experienced. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to a baby group. Lots of new babies of slightly different ages. And you get the kind of, oh, well, well, my, my daughter walked at eight months. And it's very annoying because now I have to chase her everywhere. Um, and I'm sitting there with my 15-month-old dumpling who hasn't even called yet. <laughs> and it, and it, it's a, it, I have found it a battle to think, no, I, I don't even have to enter into this comparison. But the, there is that kind of inclination to think, oh, something's wrong. They're not walking yet. That's not OK. And it, it was an attempt to steal my joy. Um, and, and I think you have to be aware of that. So, so I think comparison is the ultimate distraction. I think it's, it's like looking at your phone when you should be driving a car, you know. Sometimes we feel like a, a WhatsApp, replying to a WhatsApp message that we hear ping is the most important thing that we need to do right now. But actually, when you're driving a car, it's extremely dangerous because you need your eyes on the road, you need to know where you're going and that there's no hazards. And I think that 
it's when we try and define ourselves against other people, it's like looking at that phone when actually God's purpose for us is the road ahead and the car that we're driving. Um, it's not his design for us. <clears throat> it can be destructive to relationships. I'm going to look at that a little bit later, how when we compare ourselves to other people, it affects how we view them, and that can be very negative. Um, but I think that Jesus demonstrated a completely different way to live. Um, and I was really struck by this verse when I was doing some research on this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. So he made himself nothing. There's a, there's, an, there's a choice in there. It wasn't like God sent him to earth and was like, you're stuck, you've got no power. We, we can see when he was tempted in the desert that he could have called the angels, they could have come, he could have been seen in glory, but he chose to make himself nothing. Um, and I think that that's a choice that we can follow him in making, that humility. And it also struck me that when you make yourself nothing, there is nothing to compare. You're not holding something and saying, well, this has value, but how does, it, how does it stack up against their thing that's similar? You can't compare nothing, can you? Um, and it, it goes against how the world says we should see ourselves and how we should value the lives that we've been given. But it's how Jesus lived, so it must be possible. We've got the Holy Spirit, and he's, I feel like God's, Jesus gave us some pretty clear instructions on comparison and how we can avoid it. So I'm, I'm going to, when I was kind of looking into this, the, the Sermon on the Mount and the book of Matthew were really significant to me. Um, so I'm going to share some bits from there. So if I believe that comparison is a thief of joy, which I do, what does that mean? So joy is quite a hard thing to define, isn't it? Like, um, what is joy? We talk about it a lot. We sing about it a lot. I think that the, the psalmist has a pretty good idea. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And to me, that speaks of a closeness to God that kind of causes everything else to fade. I think John was speaking about the presence of God a couple of weeks ago, just, just the way that it causes threats or worries in our life to, to dissipate because they're put in perspective of the, the grace of God to us and the, the kind of relationship that we can have with him. Um, we often sing this song, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Um, so if that is true, then having my joy stolen is quite significant. If it's true that I'm saying, if I'm filled with the joy of the Lord, then I'm strong and I can face the things that life throws at me and I can be who he has for me to be, then if, we're, if we allow it to be stolen by comparison, that's not a great position to be in. Um, this verse actually comes from uh, the, the joy of the Lord is my strength. That phrase comes from the book of Nehemiah just after the wall's been rebuilt and the people are mourning um, because of their sin. And Nehemiah says to them, no, don't mourn, but feast for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And for me, that's just a picture of, of focusing not on our lack, on our sin, on on what's gone wrong, but focusing on the bounty and the mercy and the compassion of God and how that fills us with strength. Um, so why does it matter that um, we don't compare ourselves to other people, that we access that joy? Um, I think um, comparison has quite a few significant effects on how we see the world. Um, so. The first one I'm going to talk about is comparison warps my view of righteousness. When we compare ourselves to other people, it's all based on the external, what we can perceive, how we can judge other people, what they're doing. God is concerned with what's going on inside. Um, and what, what he, his, Jesus' approach was so different to that of the Pharisees. The Pharisees' value system was based on appearance and, and showing yourself to be a good, holy person and that way you would be approved by God. Um, but Jesus talks about a different way of doing it. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honoured by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. 
But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. That's a different way of operating, isn't it? Not looking at what someone else is giving, or in terms of time or money, or you know, how they appear in church, but saying, God, I, I want to give of my best to you and to you alone. Um, and we, we're in danger of losing sight of that righteousness that he talks about there if we focus on what others are doing. Um, there's another verse from Luke 18 um, where Jesus tells a parable um, to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So there's a sense in that last verse of that tax collector doing that thing of making himself nothing, recognising that actually his only value comes from God's acceptance of him and nowhere else. Um, when I was thinking about myself, <laughs> I thought a symptom of this for me is when I feel like I'm doing well if people respond to my actions. So people say, oh, that was really, really great the way you looked out for that person. And that makes me go, oh, cool, thanks. Then maybe I'm, I'm starting to slip into that Pharisee view of righteousness that's about what can be seen on the outside and not what's going on inside. And I think that's something we all have to watch for, because it's nice to be praised. It's nice to be told you're doing well. But actually, the only person who can tell us we're doing well is God. Um, comparison warps my view of other people. Um, I'm, I'm one of four. Uh, I have three brothers, and we're all fairly close in age. And as a child, um, dinner time was always interesting. We had this kind of obsessive desire to have exactly equal portions. Or, you know, if we, if we couldn't have equal portions, you know, you'd get there first to see which one was slightly largest, and then you'd dash off. And it actually took me quite a long time after being married to wean myself <laughs> off this and realise I didn't need to eat more than Michael. It was OK. Um, <laughs> But it was kind of built into me, like, you need to have the most, you need to have the biggest. And um, I think we're, we're obsessed with equality, particularly in our society. You know, it's become a, a word of great virtue. You know, equality is the thing. I'm not talking about you know, wider societal issues. I think we can take that equality and we can apply it to ourselves. And we say, well, I deserve this. If, if the world is fair, then I deserve to have as nice a house as they do. I deserve the recognition that they got for doing that. I, I did the same degree as them. I should be earning more than them. You know, sometimes we can, we can apply that notion that actually fairness is the thing that we should be going for. And that does distort our relationships. Um, in, the, in the story of the lost son, um, when, when the the prodigal son has come back and they had a big party for him and celebrated him. And the older brother is absolutely fuming about this because he's been all the, there all the time, living a good life, serving his father, and he gets no rec recognition. And this is what the father says to him, are you envious because I am generous? And that really arrested me, that verse. Like, do I resent God, his generosity? Because I think that's what we do when we compare our lives to other people and we say, well, it's all right for them. Nice, yeah, what about me? We don't ever want to be in a position of feeling that God is unjust because he's being generous. Comparison has innate within it the need to judge. We're saying, I'm looking at you, I'm assessing your life, and I'm holding it up against mine. And the Bible's fairly clear about judgment. Um, Jesus says, do not judge, or you too will be judged, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged and with the measure you use it will be measured to you it's not something we should be doing I feel like we become blind to people's needs if we focus what they have 
going for them. I don't know if you've ever had those relationships where someone seems to be doing really well at something and it just bugs you. Does anyone else get that? Just me? <laughs> you get that like... I, I, I'm going to be honest here. A couple of years ago, um, some, lots of my good friends got very into running and sport and doing really lovely active things. And at that point in time, I couldn't do any of that because of my health. I, I just couldn't do it. And it really, uh, for a while, it really got in the way of me thinking of them in terms of other things, because I would I'd think of them and I'd be like, oh, yeah, but they're able to do that thing that I'm not able to do. It's all right for them. Um, and actually, I wasn't focusing on what their needs were, how I could serve them, what, what God was saying to them, or what, what they might be able to say to me, because that acted as a blockage, that resentment. Um, and I, I'm always reminded of a, a talk that Paul Haycraft did a few years ago. And he talked about the ridiculous way that we compare what's going on inside of us to what's going on on the outside of someone else. And just how that makes no sense. And it's always stuck with me when I've found myself in that place of judgment and thinking, oh, it's all right for you. Actually, I have no idea what's going on for someone else unless I ask and I have enough compassion and care to do a bit of digging. Um, comparison gives us an inaccurate view of God's grace. We can fall into the trap of believing that we, we need to prove ourselves to God. You know, he's, he's, he's accepted us, so now it's my turn to do my bit. Um, the parable of the workers in the vineyard, where the workers come along at different points in the day, and they all get paid exactly the same amount, kind of shows us how little God... Care. No, he does care about our actions, but we cannot make ourselves right in his eyes. That's something that he does and he alone does. I can't build on his grace by doing good things. There's times recently when maybe I haven't been able to be as involved in areas of church life as maybe I have in the past or I see other people around me doing, and at times that's left me feeling a bit like useless, a bit like, oh, well... When the season ends, I'll, I'll get on top of that and I'll make sure I get involved in three things to, you know, be doing my thing. And, and God really spoke to me recently about realising that I can't add to my value. He sent his son to die for me and I need to allow that to free me to just be, be who I am and let him speak to me. Um, those of you with, who've had little children might be familiar with the concept of the sticker chart. Has anyone come across this? So... You're maybe tra training potty training or trying to get them to not kick you. Or, uh, and every time they do something right, they get a sticker on, on this chart. And when they get to the end, they get like, I don't know, some Lego or an ice cream or something to say, you know, you're trying to train their behavior. And God said to me, there's no sticker charts in the kingdom. I, I don't, you know, I love you and I want to bless you. And just the, the reality that my actions have to flow from his grace. They don't build his grace. My actions don't kind of stack up to make God's grace more all-encompassing. There's nothing I can do to add to what he's done for me. And it's sometimes we try and assess how good we are compared to people around us. And I think we all do it, if we're honest, at different points and in different areas of life. And as just thinking about it and thinking, actually, that's like when we... It's like getting a ruler and trying to measure the air temperature. It's a completely different paradigm. It doesn't work, but yet we convince ourselves that we can do it, and we allow that process to keep on going on underneath the surface. So here's some symptoms that you might be having this inaccurate view because you're comparing yourself to other people. And comparison distracts us from what really matters. So Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And we can often find ourselves hungering after the wrong things. We want possessions or acclaim or approval. And actually, sometimes getting more of them becomes our driver, becomes, becomes the thing that causes us to live. And Jesus is very clear on this as well. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin will destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, 
there with your heart beat also. So I had this, that for where your treasure is there with your heart beat also. My great aunt sewed me a little tapestry when I was a baby and I had it on my wall for years and I had not a clue what it meant as a child. I just really, and, and really it was only recently I, I kind of was looking at it again. And it, it speaks to me of a choice about where to invest, that you can't invest in both places. You can't say, I'll, I'll just sort, sort out my life here on earth, but I'll also have, have the good stuff in heaven, God. Actually, we need to make ourselves nothing here. I'm not saying having nice things is wrong by any stretch, but if they become our, our driver, then that's where our treasure is on earth. Um, and we can lose sight of the temporary nature of our life on earth and, and think that actually creating this lovely material world around us is all there is, but it really isn't. And God promises much more than this life of constantly trying to get the next thing. So symptoms, I'm always looking to upgrade. I worry a lot about having, not having enough money for my needs. And I think we get a bit skewed on what our needs are, and I think comparison does this. So for me, when I see someone's having a lovely holiday, and they're posting all their pictures, and I think, oh, I want to be on that beach. I need a holiday. I don't need a holiday. <laughs> I want a holiday, but it becomes, again, that sense of, well, this is my right, because they've got it. And that's because I'm comparing myself to someone else. So this all sounds a bit bleak, must be said, if it's this an innate thing that we do, and we can't stop ourselves, and it's kind of a subconscious process. And... Um, but as I was reading the Sermon on the Mount, it struck me that maybe there is a good type of comparison. Maybe there's a redirection of that desire in us that we can take. So looking back to that story of Adam and Eve, comparison actually came before the point that they sinned. So they, they made that comparison between God and themselves, and then they chose to sin. So maybe God built that into them, that ability to, to critically look and say, hmm, these things are different, or these things are the same. There's something hardwired into us, and maybe it was meant for a different purpose. Um, so in Matthew 26, no, sorry, Matthew 6, this is what Jesus says. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? So he's kind of directly instructing people to compare themselves to his creation. He's saying, set yourself in this setting. This is the setting that you, you need to look at for your value because this directs you back to my provision and my grace for you. It, it builds a, a sense of faith that actually, yeah, look at the, the, the flowers of the field. They don't worry about a thing and yet God provides for them. And sometimes we feel like we need to, to provide for ourselves and make it all happen. But actually, this is what's true. And I think Adam and Eve were designed to fit into nature in this way. The thought process would have been completely natural as they were walking around. They would see this bounty that God had created and realise, yeah, God is good. I can trust him. Um, you know, with a kind of final flourish on God's creation, he, he put us in the garden to enjoy these things. And that's where we can get our bearings on how our life is going. And this, this might sound a little bit airy-fairy. I'm not talking about everyone move to a cottage in the forest and only ever see flowers. Um, I think it's about a conscious decision to look to the things that we can rely on as evidence of God's goodness. Um, and I, I do think that being in na nature actually helps that. And there's, there's lots of research at the moment and lots of people writing about how being in the nature, being in forest, is really good for your health, both physically and mentally, and it's like this magical thing that makes you feel better. And when I was reading this, I was like, well, yeah, like, that's, that's where we were designed to get our bearings. But I don't think it has to be something that we get from just being with trees. We were in, in London the other day, and the tide had gone 
out so we could go down by the river. Has anyone ever done that? You go down, down into the mud and you can find all the bits of kind of Victorian rubbish. It's very exciting. Um, but you see the city from a completely different angle and we were kind of down low and looking up at these skyscrapers and I just had this sense of, wow, God, like, it, you created all of this. You, you created man that's created this. This is yours. And was just overawed by that sense of my, my smallness but ironically, my value because of that, it's, it goes back to that thing of Jesus chose to make himself nothing. And as we choose to be nothing, to be small, to realise I can add nothing here apart from what God graces to me, that's when we realise how incredibly valuable we are. And that's completely contradictory to what the world would say. And it's counterintuitive. In, in some senses, it doesn't really make sense. But I know it to be true for my life. I know that when I get that perspective of who I am in relation to God and all he's created, it gives me peace and freedom. So I, I still get comparison thoughts all the time, but I think the difference in me now is that I'm aware of them and I'm able to choose what to do with them. So I don't think it's wrong to have that initial thought of, oh, I'm a bit miffed that you've got this thing that I want. Or, you know, when someone's telling you a really great story and you feel like, oh, yeah, I really want to be pleased for you, but actually that's what I want. Um, I don't think that's wrong. I think it's what we do with it next, whether we bring it to God or we just let that feed in our heads and feed that sense of discontent and lack that steals our peace. So here are some questions for you um, that maybe might jog you to think whether there's a sense of comparison you're living in. Um, am I happy for other people when I hear their testimonies? It's not a holy answer to say no, but occasionally I've heard a testimony and thought, oh great, God's healed you. When's he going to heal me, me then? It's all right for you. I have a choice then to be happy for them or not and to come back to God and say, God, show me what it is you're doing here, not just making me see their big biscuit and resenting my little Maryland cookie. Do I always want new objects and experiences? Do I look at my home and wish it was bigger, more nicely decorated, in a better location, that I owned it? This is definitely something I've experienced before. I mean, living in Dagenham is lovely, but there's only so much fly tipping one can take before <laughs> wishing yourself away. But actually, when I walk in that door, I can choose, oh, it's here again, it's still in the same place, or I can see God's provision for me and be thankful. I don't want to be envious when God's, because of God's generosity. Do I scroll through Facebook or Instagram and just feel sad? Sometimes we can't put our finger on it, but it's a horrible feeling, isn't it? Do I look at other people my age and feel left behind? I should be at university, maybe you haven't gone. I should be married by now, I should have children, I should have travelled the world. It's very easy, isn't it? Because we, you know, we grow up in that school system and we're always on a level with everyone and we can, you know, until we leave school, we're kind of doing similar things and then it all, it's all open and we think, ah, I'm not keeping up, I'm not doing as well as them. But actually, that's a really unhelpful thought process and that's something that can steal our peace. When something difficult happens in my life, my internal reaction is, it's not fair, or I could really do without this. That sense of, oh, God, you've given me this. Why have you chosen that? It's not helpful. Do I serve because I think that's what I ought to do? Do I fear other people's judgment in that? That was what was going on when I was thinking, oh, once this finishes, I'll get back on the serving. There wasn't a sense of God calling me to something, and that's, that's what should control and, and drive our serving, not a sense of guilt. So what can I do about it? So obviously God has given us his Holy Spirit and he's given us some fairly clear kind of instructions on, on how he feels about comparison and what we can choose that's differently. But here are some practicals that I have found useful. They might not be useful for you, but they've been useful for me. Read, listen to, and absorb the truth. Reading the book of Matthew for me has been like, I don't know, 
having a really good long cup of tea. Just, just the kind of comfort of realising that God knows about this. He knows about this horrible process that goes on in me that actually I'm a little bit ashamed of and that he's got something to speak to it and that he has answers for me. And that's been a really powerful process and one that I think I need to be a bit more disciplined in practising in other areas. Avoid triggers. So if social media makes you feel rubbish and like you lack stuff and like you're not as good as other people and it just gives you that general, ugh, just don't do it. And that's, that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. But maybe it could be the thing for you that switches off that need to compare all the time, constantly. Look at your life in the context of God's creation. Put yourself in places that bring his goodness to mind. And that won't be the same for every person. For me, I've, I've started filling my house in a slightly obsessive way with houseplants because it, it just reminds me of God's life. And it's a bit cheesy, I know, but it just makes me feel good. I look at them and I think, ah, oh, these things are living and growing. For me, that's a helpful thing. It'll be something different for you. Practice thankfulness, not just when it's obvious. It's, a, it's amazing the number of times I've, people have said, well, what can you thank God for? And I just want to punch them. But then, actually, when you discipline yourself to do it, and you kind of, those first words out, or you write down those first things, actually, it's amazing how it flows, and you recognise, yeah, God's given me this. God's given me this tiny cookie, and that's amazing. You focus on your little cookie, and not on the giant luxury one. Look out for other people. Consciously pray for your friends. Reach out to them when you get that pang and you feel left out. Ask about what's going on for them. So that that one for me is particularly important. Do you ever get that and you're like, oh, they don't really want to hang out with me. They've chosen to hang out with them. So I'll just kind of back off from that relationship because you start to compare, you know, where do I, where do I stand in this kind of relational field? But actually, that's a complete distraction from the road ahead. That's, like, that's that mobile phone. Do something that kind of wipes that out. Reach out to someone, demonstrate love, care about them. And actually, that's the thing that God, that's how God wants us to respond. Um, so that's me done. I just want to leave you with this because I think it's such a powerful example of how we can live without comparing ourselves to other people. Wow, that was good, wasn't it? I'm not letting Charlotte get away because there's a bit she did really quickly that I wanted to go back to, mainly so I can make a better note. There you go. You were talking about the skyscrapers, and you said it was counterintuitive. It's something about the smallness of us. Go on, go over that. Okay, again. I like so, that so Jesus made himself nothing. Uh-huh. There's that sense of humbling ourselves. Of re- and, and when we look at creation, sometimes it gives us that humbling we realize I'm just a tiny piece in this massive thing that God's made but actually when we set ourselves in that and that becomes our point of reference we re- we realize kind of how significant we are to God that actually he's created us in this creation he's placed me in this in this setting and then for me that overwhelms me with a sense of wow I'm really important to God. But it doesn't make much log- logical sense, I think was my point. It, yeah. it seems like you're small. You're just a little bit of creation. So, you know, you're unimportant. But actually, it's the opposite. I like that. 